It's 6 p.m. on a Friday here in Korea. Welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Che. Let us begin with the headlines. The White House says the Seoul-Washington alliance will remain the same or grow stronger under the incoming Donald Trump administration. Lawmakers grill key government officials, including the current prime minister, to get to the bottom of the growing power abuse scandal surrounding the president's confidant. The Bank of Korea leaves its key rate unchanged at a record low for a fifth straight month, taking a wait-and-see approach that's been attributed to the uncertainties at home and abroad. The United States reaffirmed its commitment to the security of South Korea that it can only grow stronger under the presidency of Donald Trump. The statement comes out of the Obama-controlled White House. It came a matter of hours after Trump reaffirmed the alliance during telephone talks with South Korean President Park Geun-hye. Lee min -young has our top story. The White House has pledged that the United States will strengthen its alliance with South Korea under the Trump administration. White House Press Secretary Josh Earnest said at a briefing this week that there's a Democratic and Republican tradition to strengthen Washington's alliance with South Korea, adding that the decades-long partnership supersedes any individual presidency or political party. Experts in the U.S. agree with the assessment out of the White House. According to Donald Manzullo, president of the Korea Economic Institute at a conference on Thursday, Seoul-Washington alliance will remain strong under Trump, as that relationship is unique and nobody wants to see the quality of it impaired. Trump's victory has cast uncertainty over diplomatic relations between Seoul and Washington as he made a series of controversial remarks during his campaign over U.S. security commitments overseas. The remarks raise concerns that there could be a policy discontinuity in many areas, including North Korea, which requires a strong and united front by South Korea and the U.S. Trump's win also threw into doubt the fate of the free trade agreement between the two countries, as the president-elect has denounced it as a job-killing deal and vowed to scrap or drastically change the pact. Lee min -young, Arirang News. Now, is North Korea trying to send a message to America's next president? North Korea's media has published two reports on leader Kim Jong-un's visits to military units since Trump was elected. Connie Kim gives us some insight into what this could all mean. Republican Donald Trump's election to the presidency of the United States seems to have rattled North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, prompting him to show off his military as he prepares to deal with an uncertain leader in Washington. The North's official Korean Central News Agency said Friday, Kim inspected an artillery unit near the de facto northern limit line, some 18 kilometers from South Korea's Pyongyangdo Island. Kim was said to have ordered artillery drills and told his soldiers to give it their all when war breaks out. The report about the leader's visit is a second of its kind since the U.S. presidential election on Tuesday, though as is characteristic of the regime, the dates of the visits were not given. In any case, Seoul's Unification Ministry believes the North is using the reports to acknowledge the change in American leadership. Pyongyang seems to be seeking a change in Washington's North Korea policy, as change is expected from the U.S. with the election. In addition to the two reports, the North's official Lo Dong Shimun indicated in a commentary the day after the election that the North will not give up its nuclear ambitions, saying Washington's hope for the regime's denuclearization is a delusion. On the one hand, President-elect Trump's policy toward North Korea has so far been vague. He has indicated that withdrawing U.S. troops from South Korea could be an option if Seoul does not agree to a fair burden-sharing agreement, and the North has been highlighting that point. On the other hand, Trump has called Kim a maniac. While Trump hasn't said anything about North Korea since the election, he did speak with President Park Geun-hye after his election victory, and the two reaffirmed their commitment to the South Korea-U.S. alliance. In addition, the Obama administration has said its North Korea policy will remain the same. U.S. State Department spokeswoman Anna Ritchie Allen said Friday the U.S. will not recognize the North as a nuclear state and the North Korean leadership must choose whether it will achieve peace by giving up its nuclear arms or remain isolated from the international community. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is set to meet U.S. President-elect Donald Trump next week. Following Trump's win, Abe congratulated him on the phone on Thursday morning and both agreed to meet in New York on the 17th of this month, if possible. 
Japanese political analyst said Abe was able to set up such a meeting quickly because Japan's ambassador to the U.S., Sasai Kenichiro, had been contacting close confidants of the U.S. president-elect, including his daughter Ivanka, since the early stages of the Republican nominee's presidential campaign. Japanese government officials also said that Abe told Trump the U.S. will be even greater under his leadership, and in response, Trump praised Japan's economic achievements under Abe's policies. Let's zoom in on matters pertaining to South Korea's national defense. The nation and Japan have been working to sign a military intel sharing agreement to better counter North Korea's missile and nuclear threats. South's military says the two allies could sign a tentative agreement next week. Kim Yeon bin fills us in. South Korea and Japan are scheduled to sign a tentative military intelligence sharing agreement as early as next week. According to South Korea's Defense Ministry on Friday, the two allies are set to hold a third round of working-level talks to tentatively sign the General Security of Military Information Agreement. The first two rounds of talks were held in Japan and South Korea, respectively, early this month. The Defense Ministry says that it requested Seoul's Ministry of Foreign Affairs to review the initial agreed terms so they can be sent afterwards to the National Assembly for approval later this month. If the deal was passed, the two countries will be allowed to share military information on North Korea's nuclear and missile threats. Seoul and Tokyo initially tried to sign the agreement back in 2012, but have been halted due to opposition parties and civic groups in South Korea against the move, claiming that the deal was arranged in secret. Many Koreans are against the pact because of the history of Japan's colonial rule of the Korean Peninsula from 1910 to 1945, and lingering unsolved issues between the two countries. However, North Korea's ever-growing nuclear and missile threats have provided a strong momentum to resume the discussions. Pyongyang has conducted over 20 ballistic missile launches and two nuclear tests this year alone. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Meanwhile, in the domestic political arena, South Korea's political parties continue their tug-of-war over various issues. One key topic, recommending a new prime minister. Lawmakers also held a special session on the Choi soon scandal. Park ju has the latest from the National Assembly. The ruling Senuri party has called on the country's three opposition parties to sit down for talks on forming a coalition government and their recommendation for prime minister. The parties have so far refused, drawing sharp criticism from the ruling party floor leader on Friday. The opposition parties say they'll participate in a mass rally on Saturday. It's regrettable to see the parties who should be tending to the current national crisis leaving the assembly. Saturday's mass demonstration is being held in relation to the abuse of power scandal swirling around the president's confidant, Choi soon -shil. It's expected to be the largest anti-government protest in years, and all of the members of the main opposition Democratic Party of Korea's leadership have said they will participate. The president, who the public is ashamed of and who has no qualifications, should remove herself from state affairs. The minor opposition People's Party is starting to take a tougher stance on the scandal, with interim leader Park Ji-won saying Friday that the party will now join the public movement, calling on the president to resign and submit to investigation. The party also warned the administration that it will face even greater resistance from the public if it doesn't tell the truth. Meanwhile, the ruling party is dealing with its own internal conflicts and an approval rating that's hit a record low of 17 percent, according to the latest numbers out from Gallup on Friday. Members of the party's non pro pak wing are calling on the party leadership to resign immediately, and the party leaders are refusing to budge. Also on Friday, the National Assembly held a special inquiry in relation to the Che scandal. A dozen opposition lawmakers attempted to grill key government officials, including the current prime minister, but the officials mostly declined to answer, saying that they couldn't respond because of the ongoing investigation. Ruling party lawmakers did not participate in the session. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. 
With a massive demonstration set to be held on Saturday by the Korean public angry over the Chesunshil case, the presidential office of Chang Wade said in a daily briefing that the top office accepts the public's message. Saturday's rally could be one of the biggest in Korean history, with protesters possibly attempting to march up to the vicinities of the presidential office. Chang Wade also urged the opposition parties to promptly propose a new candidate for prime minister so that there's no vacuum in state affairs. With no official events scheduled for next week, President Bakune will likely continue listening to the voices of the people and try to set up a meeting with political party leaders to hear their demands and discuss the role and authority of the new PM recommended by the parliament will have. Turning our focus to the Chesunshil investigation, Seoul prosecutors will summon the head of Korea's largest steelmaker, POSCO, and a Korean court is expected to approve an arrest warrant for producer Chaeuntaek. Kim Jong-soo has the latest developments. Kwon Oh-jun, the 66-year-old CEO of Korean steelmaker POSCO, is scheduled to show up at the Seoul Central District Prosecutor's Office at 7 p.m. on Friday night as a material witness in the ongoing Chesunshu scandal. This will be the first time that a chief of a major conglomerate is summoned in relation to Che. Prosecutors allege the music video producer Chaun Tech, along with President Park geun hes former Secretary for Policy Coordination An jong Bum, and former chief of the Korea Creative Content Agency Song sung Gak, pressured a medium-sized advertising agency that had acquired Poreka, a former subsidiary of POSCO, to sell 80 percent of its shares. Cha had allegedly threatened the CEO of the agency, saying that he would use his influence with government authorities to have the company audited if he refused to comply. According to an unidentified POSCO official, the CEO resisted the demands and then POSCO severed all ties with the agency. While prosecutors will treat Kwon as a witness for now, his status could be changed to defendant if investigators find that he had assisted Cha with his attempt to take over Poreka. In related news, the Seoul Central District Court will rule on whether to approve an arrest warrant for Cha and Tech by late Friday night or possibly later. Cha had appeared in court earlier this afternoon for a hearing on the warrant. Aside from the Pareka case, Cha is accused of embezzling almost a million dollars through his personal ad agency and is also believed to have worked closely with Che sun shil in using their connection with President Park to extort money from various Korean businesses. Kim Jong-soo, Arirang News. Korea's central bank is keeping its key rate steady at one and a half, one and a quarter percent rather for November. This comes as policymakers measure the impact of a wealth of uncertainties at home and abroad. Shin Zemin has more on the BOK's decision. The Bank of Korea chose to stand pad on its monthly policy decision, leaving the key rate at one and a quarter percent with mounting uncertainties at home and abroad, pushing the central bank into a zone of caution. With that, the BOK has kept rates on hold for a fifth consecutive month. The wait-and-see approach comes on the back of an unexpected new U.S. president-elect, Donald Trump. The U.S. presidential results were largely unexpected by the markets, so unpredictability has surged, with some even unsure about the potential of policy changes. Although it's difficult to measure the exact impact this will have on our economy, we'll carefully monitor the situation and counteract accordingly. The top central banker speculated that it's highly likely the Federal Reserve will pursue its December rate hike, although questions on what changes will be seen in the country's economic policies remain largely unanswered. Adding to this variable, Korea's abuse of power scandal at home involving President Park Geun-hye and her confidant Choi Soon-sil has slammed the brakes on state affairs, giving the BOK more reason to exercise caution. Market watchers say a combination of these uncertainties and expectations for more fiscal spending under a Trump president in the U.S. will give Korea some relief from its household debt problem. This especially as the government looks to contain the overheating property market. Considering higher expectations for economic growth in the U.S., it's likely that under a Trump administration, the Fed will only raise rates once next year 
after a December hike. That could give Korea some time to see government measures take effect. Adding that it's still unclear whether Trump's campaign promises will directly translate into policies. Experts say that local financial authorities in the meantime should come up with ways to slow the growth of country's household debt pile. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. The nation's exports are showing signs of a slight recovery. The Korea Customs Service says the country's outbound shipments came to 13.9 billion U.S. dollars as of the first 10 days of November. That's up almost 20 percent from the same period last year. Exports dipped for 19 straight months, turning around for the first time in August and then falling again the following month. The agency attributed the pickup to an increase in working days over the cited period, which helped offset the impact of the discontinuation of Samsung's Galaxy Note 7. Despite cautious signs of a recovery, it's unclear whether exports will maintain the momentum given lingering uncertainties at home and abroad, especially with more protectionist measures expected from the United States. The founding families of two of Korea's top conglomerates are on Forbes' ranking of Asia's 50 richest families. The Yi family of Samsung Group topped the list for the second straight year with a combined wealth of 29.6 billion U.S. dollars, up 3 billion from last year. Hyundai Motor Group's Chung family ranked 12th with a combined wealth of 14.5 billion dollars. A Thai family running one of the world's largest producers of animal feed came in second, followed by an Indian one. The top 50 Asian families' wealth are collectively worth $519 billion. And that's all from me at this hour. For our viewers in Korea, do stick around. We have more domestic headliners coming right up. Thank you for watching. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Devin Whiting with more of your domestic news. Amid concerns over ballooning household debt, the nation's financial authorities are moving in earnest now to clamp down on risky lending by secondary financial institutions, cooperatives like Dongyap and the National Credit Union Federation. The head of the Financial Services Commission, Im Jong-yong, said today that guidelines will be issued early next year to screen borrowers' incomes extra carefully in the process of approving new loans. Currently, banks and insurers are not equipped to screen the incomes of small business owners, like those involved in farming and fishing, leading to concerns over risky lending. In addition to new guidelines, the government is also looking into more securely structured loans, in which borrowers would pay back a large chunk of the principal early on and divide up the rest of the payments. Korea's Jeju-do Island is seeing a steady increase in tourists. In fact, it's likely to have seen 15 million visitors this year, a milestone it wasn't expected to reach until 2018. Kim Yo-sun reports. The number of tourists visiting Korea's southernmost island of Jeju is expected to surpass 15 million this year achieving the Jeju provincial government's goal of marking the 15 million milestone two years earlier than it had expected. According to the Jeju Special Self-Governing Provincial Tourism Association on Wednesday, the number of visitors has increased steadily during the past years. In spite of an outbreak of the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome last year that hit the local tourism industry hard. The number of visitors to Jeju Island exceeded the 10 million mark in 2013. And as of now, 86 percent of the total number of foreign visitors to Jeju Island are Chinese nationals. So in order to diversify the tourism market, the Jeju Special Self-Governing Provincial Tourism Association announced plans to increase the number of international flights from and to other Southeast Asian countries and Japan. Kim Yo-san, Arirang News. The local health authorities have found another case of the Zika virus in a man who recently visited the Philippines. It's the 15th Zika infection found so far in Korea. According to the Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the 41-year-old patient visited the Philippine island of Mindoro for about six days at the end of October, and he developed a fever and muscle pains less than a week after his return. 
Yesterday, the virus was confirmed to have been found in a urine sample he gave at a clinic in Daegu. He is now undergoing further tests at Gyeongbuk National University Hospital. Of the 15 Zika patients confirmed in Korea, 11 had visited Southeast Asia, most of them the Philippines. The Zika virus is primarily spread through bites from infected mosquitoes, but can be transmitted through sexual contact and from mother to child via pregnancy. Those are some of the stories we're following right now. Thanks for watching. We'll be back at 8 p.m. Korea time.